The following is a conversation I had with Jace Guyman of Utah. He's a long-term guide and outfitter there. He knows his way around a lot of the state, a lot of the different units, a bunch of the different species. We cover the block and tackling of the Utah draw, but we also dive into a bunch of other cool topics. In particular, we get into politics, we get into some wildlife trends within the deer and elk populations. On the political front, right out of the gate, I asked Jace, what do Utah residents, what do the state game managers think is gonna happen whenever the Colorado transplanted wolves show up in their state? He brings up a super cool topic that I was completely clueless about. There's a native bison herd, free range bison herd in Utah that it's very likely sometime in the future the Colorado wolves are gonna come in conflict with that herd of bison. And it's really one of the very few true native bison herds. That bison herd in Utah actually has less cattle genetics than the bison in Yellowstone. So it is a pristine part of the wildlife history there, and it's gonna be crazy political when the Colorado wolves come in contact with those bison. We also talk about technology and where that stops within hunting, right? There are some changes going on around that in Utah. We end the podcast discussing a super cool meat hunt opportunity in Utah that I was pretty oblivious to. So a lot of you out there that want to just go on an elk hunt, you're concerned about getting meat, check out that opportunity. It's a pretty cool deal. On my front, I want you guys to know that I have one hunt open on May 13th for spring bear in Idaho. It's a hunt slash course. You can check it out at pursuitwithcliff.com backslash experiences. It's really for newer hunters, not necessarily brand new hunters, but hunters that want to get up the learning curve really quickly. We're going to have an awesome hunt, but we're also going to focus on skill sets that apply to all Western hunting, not just spring bear. So it should be a super cool experience. I'm also still running the strategy and planning membership site. You can check that out, pursuitwithcliff.com backslash membership. I'm doing weekly live streams or Zoom calls, covering everybody's questions, having a great time in there. I'm going to keep that up until these fall hunting seasons at a minimum. Once I get into those seasons, I'll probably adjust the schedule a little bit just due to my guiding obligation. Get on there, I'd love to have you. But for now, let's jump right into this conversation with Jace. So first thing I wanna start off with, man, is just, you know, what's new in Utah. Like the last podcast I did with the Colorado guy, we got into like a bunch of political stuff and and uh, it went down that route. And I don't mind talking about that stuff, but uh, also just, you know, wildlife stuff that's changed there. So. Anything that's interesting to you that you want to talk on that front or you just think would be very valuable for people that are coming to Utah to hunt? Perfect. Um, I guess starting off, I guess we can start off with the political side, get that out of the way. Why not, dude? Well, we yeah. may not get out of the so, way. We, we, we might have to do another podcast if we start there, but go for it, man. Yeah. So similar to Colorado, kind of the ballot box initiative type stuff, Utah has been having some issues similar to that. The Kind of starting, oh, I guess, two years ago now, there was the trail cam, trail cam ban came into place. And that was kind of a ballot box thing as a basically a legislator just decided that he didn't like trail cameras. And so Utah's had a lot of laws just kind of jump out of the woodwork at us here in the last two years um, relating to trail cameras, just so that everyone's kind of aware this coming into this year. It's same as last year. There's no baiting after July, I believe it's July 31st, no trail cameras on the mountain after July 31st till January 31st. I got so you. that's kind of a big one that anyone looking to come to the state to scout, you got to be aware that trail cameras aren't, you have to have them all pulled by the end of July and then no baits. Like, it's like even mineral attractants, you can't have them out. Like say you take a salt block and you leave it in front of your camera, you have to actually physically go pull that salt block off the mountain no later than the end of July. So I got you. How, how much, how much does that affect, you know, I know you're a guide there and an outfitter, Jace, like how much does that affect your guys' strategy? I'm just, I'm just curious. It's not, it was never a big part of my business. Um, and I think, but I think that was just a logistical thing. It's hard to run a bunch of trail cams in a wilderness area or whatever. Um, but like, what is that actually, I want people to kind of get a feel for how you guys use them and, and how I guess you guys have changed now that that law is in place. Yeah, so for, for me and, and the crew of guys I hunt with, it, it really didn't affect us. It it, it kind of gave a little bit of headache because, like, I would just leave my trail cameras year-round. I'd take them out, put them on the mountain, and then forget about them. And I'd check them, like, if I happened to walk past, I'd, I'd pull the card and put a new one in. But 
as far as like the data that I needed, like the information I needed to gain from those trail cameras, I already have it. So I put my cameras out in, you know, early June, whatever. And then by the end of July, I already know if there's a bull or a buck in that area worth keeping tabs on. And so as far as my strategy, it doesn't affect anything. Like most of my cameras sat year round anyways, and I didn't really get to them. And so as far as my strategy, like I already know the information that I could have gained from that camera. And so it it didn't it didn't affect us at all, really. Just because more headache can, happened. You, you can still get that, right? You you still get it exactly. up to that point. You just have to go back in and get them all. Yeah. Yeah. So it did limit the number I ran by a little bit, not much. I, I took maybe 10 less cameras out last year, but I feel like it hurts the individuals more, like especially out of okay. state hunters. Say they they have one scouting trip and then they come for the hunt. They could put 20 cameras, then run around and check all 20 in a day before their hunt and then they're you know they're up to speed but now that's that's no longer possible oh i got you that's it's, i'm just so naive man like that's i would have thought i i my intuition on it was it was a it was kind of like an like an anti-guide anti-outfitter type of thing because in my mind i'm thinking that you know that's where a lot of the usage was but i see what you're saying is it, it really it really affects other folks more so that's that's interesting. What what was the what was like what was the the logic behind the legislator that that did it? Um, basically, I I heard, and now this is just through the grapevine. Yeah, but sure, sure. It was like a like a personal like he went to his favorite trail cam or to his favorite hunting spot, and there's a trail camera on the tree, and then he go turns around to take a leak, and there's another trail camera, and he just got angry, like he he didn't like yeah. him, and so yeah, yeah I, just, I can I mean I don't know what your opinion is, man. Is I can see. Again, like I wasn't exposed to them that much, but I can see how they irk people. Like we're in spots yeah. where there's 20, you know, just it's, it seems kind of odd, you know, but, uh, but there's a, it, but it's like a deeper question, right? Like, you know, wh- where, where does that stop? Right. Like where, you know, what technology that we have been using for a while, all of a sudden should be stopped. I, you know, it's such a, it's like a crazy difficult one, man. Yeah, for sure. And we can get more into that later as far as like using technologies. Utah is kind of falling into a rabbit hole of using technology to control harvest rather than using tag numbers or predator control or habitat improvement. We're looking at technology like that's that's kind of the rabbit hole they're going down. Well, let's just yeah, explain it to me, man. I I think I know what you're talking about, but just dive into that right now because that's actually interesting. Yeah. So rather, rather than addressing what I would call the root of the problems, like, I mean, we're killing too many deer, we're killing, we're killing too many on the roads with guns, with whatever they're, they're trying to limit our ability to kill them. And so they're going after like, I I seen even turrets. People have talked about that, which every rifle scope essentially has a turret. It's just, yeah, sure. So they can't ban that, but like they're, they, Utah, uh, eight years ago, I think, added scopes to muzzleloaders. They allowed you to have any power scope. And going into this year, that's no longer legal. So this coming season, no scope muzzleloaders in Utah. You have to have a one power scope, a one power red dot, or open sights. There's no no multi-power scopes on muzzleloaders anymore. Oh, okay. So um, this, this is super interesting. This is going to be show you how naive I am to Utah, man. So what you're saying is they – they're they're liter- they're attempting to limit harvest by making hunters less effective through limiting technology. Exactly. That seems yep. so that seems so wild because my my intuition to it, it like the turret thing, it's like, well, I, I don't I've never seen like any empirical data, you know, Jace, but like does that actually make for you know for more, you know, for more harvest or less harvest? So that's one question. And then the other question is, does it make for, you know, more, you know, animals that are recovered too, right? Like, I, you know, you, you have to be real careful about limiting technology in the sense that, okay, now that the technology is limited, do people still choose to take less shots or, you know, that you get into this whole thing? I mean, I exactly. don't know. Yeah. And Utah, it's especially where Utah previously didn't allow scopes and then they allowed them for that you know, eight, 10, whatever it's been year period, um, they have that data. And what their data showed was it was a 3% increase in success. So okay. going from a one power scope or open sites on a muzzleloader to um, any, any power scope 
it only raised success rates by 3%, which, ah, okay. so, I mean, if, if you're talking 3000 permits and you you're 3% and that's 300 more deer got shot. Right. So it, it, I mean, three percent's not much. You you can't no, really. Yeah. Well, it's like a crazy. Yeah. It, to me, it's like it's like almost a backwards way of looking at my my intuition, Jace. And this is going to make me maybe sound like an idiot within like the Utah crowd. Is I would tend to let people do whatever, but just have strict quotas of harvest because I can control that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. Like so, they they have looked at season dates, but they're yeah. they're theory there is that like the majority of hunters go out and in the first three four days they're off the mountain anyway and so they did shorten some season dates this last year like the the rife early rifle elk hunt runs right through the center of the rut and they shortened it to a five-day hunt and so they are looking at that as an option but their data shows that the majority of people who are only going to go to they're only going to go to the unit for that amount of time anyways sure. and so shortening the hunt doesn't have as big of an effect as you would think think according to what they've seen so yeah i got you and, and is that the oh is that like openly a strategy or is that just what you you see that they're that they're they're limiting <clears throat> you know limiting technology uh do they actually openly say that that's one of their strategies to to limit yeah. harvest oh, okay yeah huh so that that's well, like are there other are there other examples of that man um so there's the trail cameras there's the scopes on muzzle loaders um they banned thermals which that one, most people are okay with any kind of night vision. Sure. Any kind of thermal imaging optic. Um, for for predators too? Yeah. Yep. That's across oh, the okay. board. For, um, coyotes are are exempt from that, but I, I believe you got to get some kind of a permit to be able to do it, or at least call in. Yeah. But um, as far as cougars, bears, they're, yeah, they're no go for any kind of um, thermal or night vision optics. Yeah, I'm um, trying to think. Oh, like the Garmin Exio site for bows. Sure, they banned that. That's that's no go. Any yeah. kind of optical enhancement on a bow. Do, so they're they've gone after quite a few things. Do you do you guide a lot of archers, Chase, or or do you bow hunt a lot yeah. yourself? Yeah. Do you, yeah, I, I'm almost strictly bow hunting myself, and then guide quite I got a few. You. So. The, the technology thing when it comes to archery, to me, I I. Like I have a real mixed opinion on this and I'm, and I have to like flesh it out in my brain, like just technology in general, when it comes to the hunting, it's like a hot topic too. You you know that as well as yeah. I do, but with archery, it, it is kind of weird, right? Because you've, you've limited hunters to use a weapon that uh, um, obviously limits their range. Right. And, uh, yeah. and that, and that, that, that's why we logically have a separate season for them. Right. But uh, when you do look at like that site, you start to think like, man, these bows are becoming like, a, you know, like they're, they're more sophisticated than rifle technology in some ways, right? When you literally have, yeah. a, you know, a, a sight on there that can range it, you know, move the pin around in the whole deal. Um, I guess the logical question, man, you know, it's like a totally, you, all you can do is give me your opinion on it. Like, what's your thought on that, dude? Is there, is there a limit to technology or what, what do you, th what do you think? Uh, well, the things like, so they, they've draw locks have already been illegal. You can't have anything that helps you hold your bow back. Sure. That's why, I mean, um, crossbows are in a totally different category. There's no crossbows in Utah without a, a doctor's assigned doctor's thing, basically saying you can't draw a regular bow. Yeah. Um, and so things like that, I obviously am okay with, like, I agree that's too much. You need to be able to actually draw your bow and make the shot happen. But like the Garmin site, like I had the option to buy one. It's not like I can't afford a $200 site or whatever it was. Right. And I chose to keep my spot hog five pin adjustable because if I shoot at 40 yards, then the buck runs to 130 and he's wounded. Like once an arrow's in the animal, all bets are off. Like I'm shooting again and yeah. the Garmin only goes to hundred yards. And so for me, I was like, oh, my, my slider site's better. And oh, so I, I got yeah, just it. yeah. So you just saw that there's limitations yeah. within the actual technology that made made sense for you to stick yeah. with what you had. Yeah. No, I, I hear you. Like me personally, I I don't think the Garmin site's a, a reach. Like I'm I was okay with it because I, yeah, I, I felt I see like my site was better, better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're just more familiar with it than than I am. Yeah. Uh, I've just seen like the marketing for it, and there is kind of like, wow, that is like a space age thing to have on your 
on your archery equipment. But I see what you're saying is yeah. you're basically saying like, look, it's not, it's not that good. I, I think we probably have a similar opinion on this man. Like, sure. The, the, the archery deal, a big one, like there, you know, you can't have 99% let off, you know, or a hundred percent let off. Like, yeah, I get that. Like, cause that, that would, that would change the whole dynamic of, you know, is it archery or not at that point? Right. So I don't yeah. know, but it's, it's all, it's all a, it's all a gray area and man, people get fired up about it, dude. If I look at oh, YouTube, yeah. like my, you know, comments on YouTube or whatever, they'll I'll have a video that's about like packing for a backpack hunt and five guys will get into it about long range shooting technology in the comments. <laughs> like from yeah. Today, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. But it's yeah, a, everyone, it, you know, go ahead. It, it's a, it's a hot button topic right now. Like everyone's looking at like like long range and long range and archery. Like I mean, sure. there almost anyone can put a slider sight on your bow and hit a three by three target at 120 yards. Now there's there's tons of guys that yeah. are stretching distance with bows and guns, and even you know, like the muzzleloaders in Utah. Like I personally like. The muzzle loaders were a single shot rifle. Like you could put yeah. a turret on the muzzle loader and enough practice, you could easily sure. make a 700 yard shot on an elk sized target. And so for me, like that, that makes sense to go back to a single power scope as far as if, if that's the point of the hunt is to limit um, your capability to take an animal. Um, but if you're using that to actually like, like the data, it only showed a 3%. And so yeah, it's not they're effect. using it as a social, yeah, yeah. it's a social construct. It's not a, it's not actually wildlife related. It's social related. Enough guys yeah, complained. Yeah. They thought that the soaps were, were too much. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny because that dynamic is really interesting that I, that I have noticed. And I think sometimes these state game departments, um, they struggle with this, man. Cause like you go to the meetings and there's people who are vocal about, that kind of topic like very vocal about it and in colorado it's like the same deal they're they're gonna limit archery elk tags right Uh uh-huh well the thing is is it's like why are why are you limiting arch if if you have a population problem why are you limiting hunts that already have like when they really break down the data it's they have like a five percent success rate these over-the-counter units you know when you strip out you know the the -the over-the-counter tags that get used on when you strip out like all that stuff that distorts the data people who are just going on over-the-counter elk hunt in Colorado they got five percent chance so why would you if you're trying to you know actually make a change why would you limit those why wouldn't you limit rifle hunts you know and it's the exactly. same, same dynamic though, dude, if you go to a meeting or you look at data that they get on, you know, surveys, every archer, you know, and I hate to say it, but particularly resident archers, they bitch about crowding. Like it's like the, you know, they, you know, rifle guys, I just, in general, like the culture of it, they're less concerned about that. Right. Um, at least, you know, at least in my experience in these meetings. So the archers basically are going to, you know, or the, that contingency that's real vocal about the crowding, they're going to get their way, you know? Um, yeah, exactly. They've kind of complained themselves into their own demise. Like, like yeah, archers, yeah. That, that's your greatest opportunity. We just took away, I don't know how many thousands of tags yeah, Colorado yeah. planning on basically cutting. That, that's, that's thousands of opportunity hunts, which now that's going to flood over into Utah and make our oh, draw yeah. harder. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah, by complaining now, now they don't have the opportunity to even be there. Whereas if it was actually about the wildlife, you just cut, you know, 100 rifle tags and then you save 80 elk or whatever. Yeah, it's just like but, a more direct, a more direct path. Yeah, there's, yeah. you know, or just, you know, slash all the cow tags or something like that. There's yeah. this, you know, but there's, there's always just dynamic that I think if you're not like in there dealing with it. And that's why I always like give them, um, I try not to like crap on them too much nowadays because I think it's a real hard job, man. When you got like, yeah. I would, I, I used to go in the meetings, Jason, and be like, I cannot believe you guys are killing one single cow in this unit or that unit or whatever. And I'd be pretty vocal about it, you know, and, and, and then there'd be a guy who, you know, he took his kids on a cow hunt every year. And 
you know, here's this outfitter saying that like his kid shouldn't be able to go on a cow hunt. And of course that guy is going to complain about that. And yeah, and I get it. Like I, in the, the state guys have to deal with that dynamic. Like, okay, maybe Cliff's right. Maybe not. Maybe I was just an idiot, but assuming I'm right, you know, he's like in from their third person perspective, if they agree with me, they're like, it's a horror. It, it, they, they lose either way. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. It's, lose, lose. Cause you got to keep the social sentiment. Yeah. Yeah. Happy. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. 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 But. You know, um, uh, and we can talk about it, any other poly- political stuff in Utah that you have, but I want to ask you one thing, man, cause I really want to hear your honest opinion on it. What's the, uh, um, what's people's perspective in Utah on the Colorado wolf deal? Uh, you know, if they should, if they, if they, you know, what's the speculation on if they'll actually come your guys' way, what would occur if they do any of that stuff? Uh, everyone's you'll you'll see on social media the hashtag SSS. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. That that that's Utah. Like yeah, everyone yeah. I talk to, they shoot shovel and shut up. <laughs> yeah, yeah everybody's yeah. Yeah, yeah they, if they come cross that the way. border, like yeah. So and I, I think they will. I think the Uinas and even San Juan, like the one of the release sites was just across the border from our San Juan unit. Yeah. Um, and then not too far. I mean, it's not a stretch to think a wolf. We just barely had a collared cougar, which cougars aren't known to roam quite like wolves do. They collared her. And then she traveled over a thousand miles in like, I think it was like three months. She sure. swam flame George Lake, like, like a thousand yards swim across the lake. And then a thousand miles in just a couple months into Colorado who's to say those wolves aren't going to come across into the henry mountains it's only what 70 miles or so as a curl flies from the colorado border right. and that's one of the last pure blood free range bison herds in america i mean that's oh, yeah. the purest genetic bison herd i think that there is like even the yellowstone bison have more bovine genetic mixed in than, than our henry's bison do at this point Oh, dude, I've I've never heard this. This is like a really interesting, or I mean, it would be really unfortunate, but that would be like a really crazy political thing to happen, right? So Colorado's wolves go over. Now they're interacting with like a, a like a true piece of like a pristine or like a you know what would be symbolic of like a pristine ecosystem. These pure you know pure blood uh, bison, huh? Is there is there a um? Is there like a, a structured, uh, like a, within the, um, fish and game in Utah, is there, have they put out any idea of what they would do if they, if they come across? Yeah. So they've, thankfully we've kind of been getting out ahead of it. They've sure. seen it coming for a couple of years now. And so they do have, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how deep it goes, but they do have some caveats in place some things that, um, that allow them to control the wolf. So it's not going to be like a, like a Yellowstone situation where we can't shoot a wolf if we see it, they will. Uh, basically, the sounds of it is they'll instantly institute a hunt, oh, and, okay. and they'll be allowed to 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 take them. But I think initially their plan is to capture them and transport them back to Colorado. But okay. that, that we can only spend so many dollars freaking putting what these a, killers back on the last. Yeah, what, I mean, what a waste of money, right? That exactly. was like. Uh, I was I was reading this crazy article, Jace, uh, and it was from probably you know probably you'd consider it like a little bit of like a left leaning uh, media in Colorado, and it, one of, I guess a couple of the wolves there's you know they were moving up towards the Wyoming border, and there was like some outcry because the CPW you know th- they were asked directly you know if these wolves go into Wyoming are you going to go up there and get them, and they're like. No, like of course yeah. not. But but it was like the way the article was written, it was like, oh, I you know, like I can't believe that they wouldn't go up there and catch them and bring them back because they're gonna get killed in Wyoming. And it's like, I mean, how crazy irrational is this whole thing? I mean, it's I one, I don't think people realize how expensive that kind of thing is to do. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Like look at it, it's no different than the sheep. We the the wild sheep in utah in nationwide struggle and so everyone's always looking to get sheep and sure. it took like like kuyu they just stepped up and did basically solely paid for utah to get a whole new nursery herd of sheep yeah and that was hundreds of thousands of dollars um 
and, and it's no different with wolves. I mean, you got to go yeah, net yeah. them out of a helicopter or whatever, check them for disease. They do all their all their studies that way. It's it's thousands of dollars per wolf. I'm not, I don't know the numbers, but I'd assume north of oh, twenty yeah. grand. Yeah, I'm like, sure, man. You're just all the helicopter time. If you were gonna go go capture them, I can, I can, I could just put myself like. If I had chose like that career path in life, like I was a guy that you know did wildlife capture, I could just imagine like living in Walden, Colorado, or something, and getting the call like, "Hey, you got to go get these wolves. They're gonna shoot them in Wyoming." I just can't. I just be like, "Like, what kind of irrational world do I live in? Like, isn't there something better yeah. I could be doing?" But uh, but yeah, it's so it's so uh, so wild, but. But so, yeah, so you guys would at least bring them back. You'd bring them back to the good old Coloradoans at least once. Yeah, I think that's the conversation. Like, as far as I understand it, that would be the initial approach. But I mean, yeah, like do that once and then the pack doubles and then you've got to do it 30 times the next year. It's not going to happen. <laughs> well, yeah, that, yeah, that's the reality, right? Like if they get established, you know, somewhere near that border, you guys will eventually have to have to deal with them at scale, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. They'll, they'll find... You know, they're, I think, you know, I don't know how much experience you have with them, dude, but they're, they're, dude, they're so analogous to human hunters from what they're like unchecked human hunters. Like they, they have a really uncanny way of finding where there's density a game, like they're going to go find it, you know? And so, uh, so yeah, hopefully they stay at your guys' Buffalo, but yeah, dude, I had, I had to ask that because I always, I kind of speculate, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, anything else before we jump into the Utah draw, man, anything else that's interesting going on? Like on the wildlife front too, Jace, like, do you got thoughts on, you know, trends in the elk, trend in, trends in the deer, you know, what people should think about maybe in like a long-term strategy for hunting Utah? Yeah, so long-term Utah is trending down on age objective. So like our elk herd specifically, we're, we're shooting for more opportunity and lower quality. So kind of heading towards Colorado, like, um, yeah. some of our premium units have been managed for eight year old plus bulls and they're dropping that age objective. So basically that means that translates to more tags. They're adding tags statewide in all of our, our limited entry units. And so my opinion would be like, if you can hunt a solid unit now or in the next like two years, you probably going to, are going to want to, because in 10 years, our premium units are more than likely going to be the same quality for double the points that the unit now is yeah so so elk's trending down deer deer are their own issue in utah are unfortunately so we had like the oak creek unit um kind of been one of our best producers of trophy bucks the last couple of years but okay so they transplanted a bunch of deer off antelope island so they're these genetic freaks like they just get huge sure and then the unit had burned not too long ago and so, you know, the first 10 years of a burn drastically helps antler growth and kind of the whole state is in a downtrend on our, basically our deer habitat, everything. We're okay. getting a lot of old growth. All of our burns are getting old, kind of losing the luster. They're not, they're not growing the horns that they used to and giving the deer the fawn recruitment that it used to like feed is everything with deer. And so Utah is kind of in a tough spot. I feel like we need to just light half of our pinion juniper on fire and is all that, of our is, old is that, is that what it's it is man you're getting the choked off like old growth like junipers yeah we, we've got a lot of that and then all of our old burn areas are just too old like the henry mountains the oak creek all the units that we're famous for the burns are like 20 years old now and so it's they're just kind of getting old woody veg vegetation the deer aren't growing like they used to yeah so Utah deers, it's good. Like we're solid. And this year is looking phenomenal. Our winter is, is great. Like we have literally like the perfect storm brewing this year for antler growth. All of our deer and elk are super healthy. Sure. Coming into winter and then winter was light and now we're getting late moisture. Like as we're recording this, it's snowing outside. So yeah, I got you. <laughs> it's, it should be a good year for growth, but overall our deer are trending down. We need yeah, some just like the overall habitat. trend. Yeah, that's yeah. that. Um, just so people, just so people that are that are listening who who maybe haven't seen like old old growth juniper and the dynamic you're talking about, describe what it does, Jace, because it's actually I've seen areas in Colorado that in my life, like when I was a little kid, went from phenomenal mule deer habitat, like 
crazy good to you're not going to you're not going to see any wildlife period in. So explain what explain what happens with they you know. Yeah, so those pinion juniper patches, they're they don't grow super tall, but they grow really dense. They can grow super close together. And mm-hmm. so they'll start growing in a new growth pinion juniper patch. I mean, it, it's not detrimental because you can still get grass. You got your bitter brush or sagebrush, whatever coming up through. And there's enough water to go around. There's enough sunlight reaching them and it's good habitat. But as soon as those, those juniper patches start getting old, the tops fill in so tight that nothing can grow underneath. So the, yeah. the, canopy basically kills everything underneath so you don't have any brows any grays anything it's just this useless tree patch yeah it's, cra- so, it's like literally the ground will be dirt right like it like yeah i mean it, in a lot of the patches that i've seen it, it's it's not even like grass it's just like it's just dirt you know um yeah I, I think they have like a pretty big annual like drop like they have the little berries on them and their leaves I think it drops a lot and it just sterilizes the ground underneath them. There's not enough moisture and they they're water hogs as well. So it's yeah, just yeah, they, a lose, lose, lose with those trees. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're uh, my understanding and tell me if, if you've heard different man is they're like their cycle is super dependent on fire. And so if you have fire suppression, you end up with this real crappy habitat be, because of that. Exactly. And our pine forests are, are the, in the same state. We've got all these old growth pines that are, you know, seven, they're all the same age and they're all a hundred years old. Yeah. And if, if we didn't have fire suppression, they would have burned and then we would have had a, started the process over. And so kind of Utah's whole habitat, we've, we've protected ourselves into a point where the habitat's ruined. We need a lot yeah, of habitat yeah. restoration. Yeah. And I, and dude, it's such a hard problem. And and Utah is probably not the, I mean, all the States don't you think kind of suffer from that a little bit, you know, there's been a, yeah, just the fire suppression off across the West. It's funny, man. Like I I want, I always want to go down a route of like, you know, fire suppression is like big business or whatever, but I, I, my personal thought on it is that the reality of it is, is that there's a lot of people living up in the mountains and everybody wants to protect their house and people want to protect, you know, that, you know, that sort of thing. So obviously suppression, um, caught a hold for decades because that was, that's been the mentality and man, like, I don't know how they're going to ever change that, you know? Yeah, well, at this point, we've got, you know, you've got the climate activists, you have everyone right? that fire is so frowned upon. And then logging, I mean, logging is frowned upon too. And really, if you can't burn it, you might as well log it and they won't even let us do that. So it's, it's kind of a, a social issue more than, more than a wildlife issue with that aspect of it. Yeah, I think, I think you're right, man. I mean, I think uh, from what I've read, like logging is not as good as burns but it's at least it's at least part of the it would help and uh yeah. i'm totally i'm totally with you on that dude there's a there's a really good uh podcast series that's about like the spotted owl and, and like the logging uh-huh. deal in the northwest um if anybody who's listening to this if they're interested in like the logging dynamic and that sort of thing they should listen to that it's it's for sure it has its own bias in it I think it's actually like an NPR uh, podcast, but it, it has its own bias. But at the same time, it's pretty transparent about what happened. I mean, basically all that country was protected and it all burnt down. All the old growth that was protected all burnt down. And it crazed the, and it caused a bunch of, you know, economic havoc, you know, being protected. And it's, it's really an interest, kind of a sad story too, but uh, it's an interesting one, man, if you're interested in that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'll have to listen to it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll get the name of it. I can't remember what it, what it, what it's called, but it's something about the owl or something like that is the name of the podcast, but um, yeah. Yeah. So, and then your, your elk, what, why, uh, why the, um, the decrease in age class man is it just is it just they want to increase opportunity revenue maybe who knows yeah basically opportunity so they they claim looking at the data they said that they can lower the age by a full year and that allows them to almost double permits without affecting quality drastically which Ah. that that's what they say obviously the data is not there yet i think that they're wrong that's just my personal sentiment I don't think you can kill that 
Because just because you have 20 eight-year-old plus bulls on the unit doesn't mean those 20 get killed. You know, right. maybe one or two of the best hunters are going to kill those. And so you need extra big bulls to keep the hunt quality up. You know, you're never going to kill all of them. And so if you don't have X number, you can't kill so many less. Right. And, and so by lowering that age objective, you're taking the number of those old bulls on the unit down especially over like a five-year period, like say this year, this eight-year-old bull lives. Well, next year he's nine and he gets killed. Odds of him living two, three more, being a 13-year-old bull. A lot of elk I've seen don't actually peak until 11, 12, 13 years old. That's when they're their biggest. And so we basically, we won't have that anymore in the long term. It's going to take several years, but it'll slowly lower our, our age by pretty significant amount. Sure. And I bet it, it's kind of hard to speculate, right? Because you know what I've seen, man, in units where they change that dynamic, they go from like maybe a really tight quota and then they they maybe triple it or they change like their management objective is the uh, the um, the makeup of the hunters changes. You know what I mean? Like the type of hunter that's in in the unit. Um, I, I saw it in a couple of deer units and uh, it, I mean, it's not. I'm not critiquing, you know, people having different styles of hunting or different goals or whatever, but it's just the fact, right? If you take a unit and it's got three buck tags in it and now it has 30, you know, 15 of those 30 guys are, are you know, they just want to find a nice looking deer. Whereas yeah. the three before they wanted to kill like the three biggest deer in the whole, the whole thing, you know? Yeah. You no, know, that um, makes sense. Yeah. So I think it, so who, it'll be interesting to see how that, how that all, all looks. Hey, uh, you know, you, uh, um, you mentioned Antelope uh, Island. Do you know the history of it, man? Do you know the history of Antelope Island? Like how the deer were put on there and any of that? I really don't know the history of it that well. I know they basically decided to set it aside as a nursery herd for the state. So we've got deer, bison, and sheep on the island, which they had a, basically all the sheep got diseased. They had to go shoot them all here uh, two or three years ago. And now we've got a new herd that's like Montana genetic, like freak of yeah. nature, big sheep on the island. And But it's just our nursery herd. I don't know how long it's been established or whatever. They they allow one buffalo and I think two deer to get shot on the island each year. No sheep. They've never allowed sheep hunting on the island. But Oh, they never have. Okay, cool. Yeah, not, um, not to my knowledge, unless it's been, I mean, 10 years ago, yeah, maybe yeah. They, 15 sure. years ago. But. Yeah, the reason I asked, I'll, I'll, I'm always curious about like those those islands or places that are are like that because um, you know a place like that you wonder if the original genetics were actually Utah genetics. You know, um, I don't know if yeah. you know the answer to that. Do Do you know the answer to that or? Um. So the the bison they originally got from Yellowstone, I think, somewhere okay. Wyoming. Um, and then the. The sheep, obviously, now, I originally the sheep came at, from out of Utah. I don't remember which state. Okay. Now they've been they've been shot. Now the new ones are Montana genetic sheep. Yeah. And um, the, the mule deer, who knows? And then the mule deer, I have no idea on the native, whether they were native Utah genetic deer. I am I would assume just because we have our own yeah. deer. It's not like we would have to borrow them, but. Yeah, yeah. They they were big like the the they island was. has crazy genetics so i don't know if that's just a aspect of so many years of controlled management or or what but yeah or if or if they were picked off somewhere in utah and, and put their you know they got big ones or whatever it's crazy man i i feel like uh i it must have been an era that was is now like 80 80 to 100 years ago but guys were moving around wildlife all over the place you know what yeah. i mean like you know, there's there, you know, like, like those, those islands around like Catalina and California, you know, guys had stocked that with crazy big mule deer at one point. Yeah. Um, you know, right now I'm in the Caribbean and there's islands here, Jace, that have whitetail on them. You know, they were stocked oh, with yeah. white. Yeah. They were stocked with white. Like people don't even know that. Um, there's a, you know, in the, it's just crazy how many different, like how many just freely people would move wildlife around back in the day. You know? Yeah. Just look at Texas. That's, that's modern day. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. It's been like but, contained there now. Are your guys' uh, mountain goats considered native or non-native? I think they're native. Um, I know that they're expanding 
trying to get them into more mountain ranges. Oh, they originally, are. Okay. originally, it was just like the Uinas, you know, and now, yeah. now we have like 15 goat units. Goats are probably Utah's biggest success story right now. Like we're growing a lot of goats. They're, they're looking at new units. They just moved them to, to you, new units several years ago, like the Dutton and a few other places. Um, but yeah, we've got, we've got some thriving goat herds now. I think that they are native originally. I don't quote me on that, but yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure. I, I, I don't know what the real, at least Colorado, man, I don't, you know, it's, it's like, a, it's still kind of up for debate in Colorado. The, the biologists say that they're non-native in Colorado. That's like the, the current thing. But it's like a very gray, gray area. When I see them, man, when I see them in, you know, the, you know, I've seen them in pictures in Utah or I've always seen them in Colorado. They kind of like, to me, it's hard to believe they're not native, dude. Like they're in like yeah. a spot that they're, you know, they, they look like they should be there. But I, I don't, I don't know. It is, it's crazy though, because what you described um, in Utah is the exact inverse of kind of the mentality in Colorado with them. Right. They're kind of, they're, they're, you know, they have, they view them pretty much as non native. So they're, they're still managing them very much like a game species that, you know, like within that sheep, goat, moose type of realm. But uh -huh. they're, they don't want them to expand at all, you know. Um, yeah. That doesn't make sense to me. I mean, they fill a niche that nothing else wants. They live at the top yeah. of the world. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, so. well, you know how it is. There's always people who, you know, there's, there's always, I mean, if anything gets categorized as potentially non-native, it's like all of a sudden it's open for persecution, even if it's, you know, harming like a lichen or something, you know, kicking rocks or whatever people all of a sudden, uh -huh. you know, make up some reason for it not to be there, but yeah, who knows? It'll be interesting. Have you, have you hunted goats yet? No, not yet. I've got, nice. I think I'm up to six points in Colorado. So I got my three and then three. Yeah, yeah. Bonus point, whatever however they call them, but yeah, yeah, whatever the yeah, yeah, weighted points or whatever. Um, yeah, I'll hunt that eventually, but no, nah, they're they're awesome, man. So that that it's good to hear that Utah's getting more and more of them, and they seem to do like you know pre, it, like they're not so sensitive to predators, man. So for some reason, like in Colorado, they're way more re, they they reproduce way quicker and way faster than they do in like British Columbia and stuff like that. So I'm sure Utah's the same, but. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, man, let's let's dive into the uh, the draw stuff. Um, start well first. T you know, I didn't even let you do this, man. Tell people like where you operate and what your focus is, and then just jump right into. Let's just start with mule deer in the draw. Like what your what, what your overall thoughts are. Um, you can. I mean, you're welcome to get into unit specific stuff, man, or you can just give me kind of general advice to people. Go for it, man. Perfect. So um, yes, we operate. More mostly like central to Southern Utah. Um, we don't really do anything in Northern Utah, but anything from like mid state down, we pretty much have a guy that can cover it. Um, basically all species. We kind of specialize in elk, deer, and sheep, but like a couple of the guys have done goat and moose and we, we do bear and lion as well. We have hounds and do a lot of bear and lion hunts. And so pretty much any spe pronghorn, any species in Utah from mid state down, um, that's with apex outfitters and so yeah, that's, that's kind of us in a nutshell, but, um, mule deer are, we're looking good for this year. If you have the points, this is a great year to hunt like every, every unit that I'm familiar with, which is pretty much the whole Southern half of the state is like the perfect storm. Like I mentioned earlier, we had like late storms last fall that caused this late green up. And that grass got tall and thick and then it stayed kind of mild temperatures like clear into October. And so like just crazy amounts of grass on the mountain when normally it was dead and like trampled, it was still green and, and lush. And so the deer like fat as can be super good health. And then they went through winter, kind of same story, like mild winter rolled in slow and kind of gave them time to move to their winter range and come and like get comfortable. And then the last like month we've got like one storm after another, after another, and it's just been consistent storms, but not so much that it's detrimental. And so I think we're going to have like a, I don't even know what you'd call it. Like just banner year, the growth's going to be phenomenal. So yeah, looking good that way. 
um, especially like the more deserty units. Um, the Henry's always responds well if you, that's kind of the premium unit in Utah. Um, the Ponsagant's a desert unit. Jace, when you say the deer are from a growth perspective, <clears throat> like are you, are you comfortable like giving like a, like a rough number, right? Like let's say a deer who, like how much fluctuation is there in your deer? Like if it is, is it like, could it be 20 inches? Is it just, you know what, like, give me a feel for that. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's been several bucks that I've watched on in the past. We're like, um, just a, your run of the mill, like mild year, like a, just a good year to a great year, like a really good moisture year. They'll put on 25, 30 inches. Okay. So it's huge. And, yeah. And like last year we were, we had like a crazy downturn. So like the winter came in late. I, I believe it was like February, like 26th. We had a storm that dumped over two feet of snow on most of Utah. And, and then it just kept pounding storms after that. And so we had a lot of die off, a lot of really sick animals. Like they barely lived through last winter. Yeah. And so from last year's antler growth, there was a lot of bucks like, if a buck grew 180 inches last year, he could very easily be 240 this year. Like, so it's crazy with, difference. Yeah, there was there was a buck on the Oak Creek unit a couple of years ago that it wasn't even like a crazy year, crazy bad to crazy good. It was just a average year to a decent year, and he went from like a 210 to a I think he was like 264 when he got killed. Yeah. <laughs> so one year, 50 54 inches. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like this year, this year could be like a 50 inch swing year. Like if a buck was whatever last year, he could be 40, 50 inches bigger this year. Yeah. Do you do you see a similar dynamic in your elk or is it a little less profound? Uh normally I would say less, but this year the elk got hammered by that winter. And so like there's one bull in particular that I've had trail cam pictures of. I picked up his sheds and so I know how old he is. Like I've I found his shed as a two-year-old. And then I've, I've seen him every year since and, and he's super unique config configuration. So I know it's the same bull, but so last a year ago, he was like a three thirty class bull as a five-year-old. And then last year he came back as a six-year-old after that last winter as like a two ninety. Okay. And I mean, five to six should be a, a big growth year. And he lost easily 30 inches, possibly 40 inches of growth. That's and so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to find him this year. I think, uh, cause I, I know he lived in, into the winter to shed. And so as long as he, he come, came through winter healthy, which he looked healthy last time I saw him, I'm expecting him to be like 360, like, yeah. like literal 60 inch plus growth year. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's wild, man. Um, I think this comes back to our original discussion about the trail camera stuff. I That's, you know, my guiding and outfit, I didn't, I never got to watch very many, you know, deer or elk live their whole life. You know what I mean? <clears throat> we killed a lot of like highly migratory deer. Um, and then I didn't, you know, I just didn't, I didn't, I, it's hard to keep tap, tabs on stuff that goes to the deep, deep wilderness. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting to hear stuff like that. Cause I, 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 I pe somebody asked me, I, I couldn't really, you know, I couldn't really tell you, you know, other than what we, what we killed and to be honest in the in the the you know the high elevation stuff in colorado i didn't notice that much difference you know what i uh -huh. mean but but it's hard because you're, you're you're not if you're not keeping track of the same deer you don't know i mean you could it could be a down year for antler growth and you just happen to kill the two or three biggest bucks in the migration route you know what i mean so but yeah no that's crazy i, I would have never thought there was that big of a difference so yeah, if you're a guy who's got a bunch of points, like probably should start thinking about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Thinking really hard about it. Like if, if I had the points, like I'm, I'm kind of low in the point pool everywhere right now. I drew an elk tag a couple of years ago. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just going for like any opportunity I can get. If there's a hunt that has good odds, that's what I'm applying for this year. Just yeah, to try and you. get in on, you know, it's going to be that good. I feel like so. Yeah um do you we can jump we can jump into elk and then we'll do we, we'll do sheep and goat too um perfect so uh yeah yeah what's the rundown on elk yeah similar similar story like growth's looking excellent um they they're just super healthy and so great great units still like last year was the first year they implemented the tag 
tag increases and their plan was to kind of ease into it. So they didn't add as many tags as they said they intend to. And so we killed more elk last year than we ever have, but not by much. And so like going from a down year to a good year, now's a great time to burn before we, because I, I, they haven't released the tag numbers yet. That's one thing to keep in mind. If you're looking up draws and whatever, it won't be until early April when they right. establish tag numbers for the coming season. And so application period opens March 21st. Um, but I believe it doesn't close till April 25th. And so you'll probably want to just wait until like mid, like April 15th, like make sure those tag numbers are out. Look at what units you're interested in. Make sure that there's enough tags that you can get your tag, like look at your points and, yeah. and figure it out after mid April. Yeah. But, and, and give, give uh, the listeners like an, uh, like a, a, a quick and dirty on that is the, in terms of the draw being like all preference, how, how does it, how does it work? Yeah. So it's 50% preference. So um, 50% of the tags are allocated to the highest point holder. Um, and then after that, there's a random pool and 10% of the total tag numbers go to non-residents. And so yeah. e- um, obviously inside like the sheep, moose, goat, world, bison, non-residents odds are just terrible. Sure, but yeah, for yeah. elk and deer, you can, you can pretty well plan when you're going to draw your tag as far as when you're guaranteed, but there's great odds in the random pool actually for a lot of units. You can kind of play that, look at weapon, weapon choice, season dates. Utah just added last. Um, mm-hmm. So they, they implemented a mid season rifle hunt on a couple of units as like an experimental thing, probably five years ago. And then last year they added that mid season rifle elk hunt. So it's October, like October 8th or somewhere thereabouts. Okay. And it's the longest hunt. It's like a 15 day hunt. And that's by far 30% of non-resident or 30% of all tags, non-residents and residents are in that hunt zone. Okay. So if you want the best odds, you've either got to go archery or mid-season rifle. And that's yeah. where the most tags are allocated. That that mid-season rifle for elk, um, you, and it, you said it starts like the 8th of October. Yeah. Do, do you guys notice rut activity at that time still? Yeah. So every year there's a lot of bulls rutting still, but it's usually the younger bulls, like pretty yeah. much everything over like a six, seven year old bull. It seems like they're done, like no rut activity. They're off hiding in a thick pocket somewhere yeah. and you've got to hunt them more like a mule deer, like blast them up. And sure. So. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> no, that, uh, that makes sense. And so also, I guess as they've increased the quotas, it's obviously going to, better your chances in the random draw and then on the preference point side of the draw like last year did you see did preference did the required preference points come down at all or were they pretty much like steady um pretty steady so i'm expecting like this year where they they shortened the early rifle hunt to five days they took scopes off muzzle loaders um and then that mid season has the the longer dates and you're using a scoped rifle and whatever I'm I'm kind of expecting that hunt to actually climb a little bit, okay. and muzzle loader and early rifle to take a slight dip. I got so. you. Good deal. Um, yeah, and I cut you off, man. We were yeah on elk. Do you have? I guess you're saying that every all the regions are probably good in terms of like, yeah. Basically, just look at where your points are and then look yeah. up um, where what you can draw. Yeah, but um, isn't it isn't it hard? Want- to- yeah, go ahead, man. I, I was just gonna say, if you're wanting to hold out for a premium unit, I can give some suggestions, like kind of the units that are doing really well right now. But it's kind of it's not hard. Like all you gotta do is look at the units that have that require yeah, the yeah. most point. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll let I'll let you shout some out of like the the better ones that you guys like hunting and stuff. But I have to make this comment, man. Isn't isn't the like when people ask you for a unit? It's hard to answer now, right? Because everybody's got oh. go hunt. Everybody has the same data. It's like exactly. the, the draw, the reality is like what it draws at. There's for better or worse, there's not a whole lot of like sneaker, like at least my opinion, man, there's not a whole lot of sneaker elk and mule deer units. I think when you get into small units, like small herd stuff, like you got units that have 50 sheep in them or 10 sheep in them. Then all of a yeah. sudden, like then all of a sudden, like go hunt, 
doesn't really matter anymore because you got to you got to have like herd knowledge to some extent but yeah. it's hard to answer on on deer and elk i i mean do you find the same yeah. thing it's just kind of a blanket like i mean you've got go hunt epic hunting fool all these guys and they all give the draws they all give the statistics they all give a breakdown of the unit and so you you if you're willing to pay a hundred dollar a year subscription you can pretty much know all the local knowledge as far as yeah, units yeah. obviously there's like the micro areas sure. within the units and, and how to hunt them whatever but yeah, yeah. but, but what 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 are your favorite ones what are your favorite mule deer and elk places to hunt like what, what like what are your dream hunts uh for me personally the henry mountains i know yeah. the unit extremely well i love the unit like i i shed hunt and hunt it every year for a long time now and so plus it is one of the top three units in the state so so for me, the Henry Mountains is kind of the premium, but then I really like like the San Juan unit. It's probably like the fourth or maybe fifth best deer unit in the state. But I just love the terrain. It's like big old growth ponderosas, super cool unit for deer. So yeah, those would be my personal deer preferences. Um, as far as elk, the San Juan unit definitely doesn't have the top end potential that, so like the beaver, the boulder, um, the Penguin Lake, a few of those units have the really high top end, but the yeah. San Juan is like probably the most fun hunt. If you're happy with a like 340 to 360 type bull, the yeah. San Juan's the best there is. Like it's a riot. So such, such a fun hunt. So yeah, it's a good time. Yeah. And those, I mean, those are yeah. huge. That's huge. It's so funny to hear you say that. Like those are huge bulls. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Um, I know you guys, yeah, get, super you guys big, but yeah, you guys are, you guys get into hunting bigger stuff, but you know, that's, <clears throat> those are huge elk. So, so it sounds like, sounds like a good time, man. Um, yeah, let's hit on, hit on uh, sheep and goat, man. Yeah. So sheep, um, I love hunting sheep. Like I've, I've been trying to get more and more into it every year. And so, um, just love it. But Utah has, what is it? I think five or six Rocky mountain bighorn units. Um, so there's, there's two units. There's the Fillmore Oak Creek. And then the, I just blanked what it's called. Cause I tried saying it. Another no, unit right. that both have, Cal they both have California bighorns. So they're the smaller subspecies and they subsequently take less points. Like, so if you're just looking for the best draw odds, those are the units you want to look at. So the the, the um, Cali then, the Cali subspecies is easier to draw. Yeah. Okay. Yep. In Utah, it, it takes a solid four points less. Huh. Okay. And they have an archery only option for for both of the units, and that archery only hunt takes even less. So. I got you. Um, but yeah, then we have there's um, of the other rock units. There's the Wasatch. It has some really good genetics, but the age class is down. It's it really needs like a couple of years of basically no tags to let kind of a I hate to say like an overburden of sheep. You can't really look at them like elk and deer where the top couple die of natural causes, it's fine because I mean we're already only killing, you know, 20 or whatever Rockies in the state a year. Letting two or three die of old age is a big deal. Yeah, sure. And and so I, I guess I can't really say don't kill any, but basically kill like one or two rams off it for the next five or six years and let a few more older sheep grow up. Yeah. You know, um, dude, I, I, I gotta get your opinion on this and I've never asked a state biologist or, you know, a, a game manager why they don't do this, but the dynamic you just mentioned, right? Like you really, you really don't want a bighorn to die of old age because there's just not no 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 state like if you compare it to deer and elk like it's like a freaking fraction of a fraction there's so many people who would love the opportunity to hunt them why would you ever want one to die of old age right like obviously it's going to happen yeah. or whatever but you know you'd, you'd rather harvest an animal i always wondered like why are the states not why do they not look at the sheep you know like right now and they'd be like, hey, like this unit, like we haven't, you know, let's just, let's, there's one ram in there that's, you know, should be, you know, is a, you know, it's going to be obvious that whoever hunts this unit, they're going to kill that ram. Let's put one tag in it. And then next year, the same unit, they look and they're like, well, none of these, these are, they're all young, you know, let's not kill any this year. They're, they're not, they do that. They do it, but it's always got a lag. They're not, they're not very dynamic about it. 
You know what I mean? And I, wonder, I always wonder why. Yeah, I, I couldn't answer that because they fly it. I mean, I think Utah is on like a two-year or three-year rotation where every sheep unit is flown minimum every like third, second or third year. And so they know exactly what's on the unit. They're not really missing much. And they categorize right. them, you know, class class two, class three, class four rams. And that's just like an age structure. And it's like the Wasatch, they flew it. And I think that there was like one or two class four rams on the whole unit. And so that tells me like we need to not kill that many sheep because they're young. Like we just don't have enough old sheep on the unit. And right. that, I, I agree with you. They, they should do that. They should be more proactive with, with looking at age. But I guess... I yeah. don't know what their reasoning is. Like, I imagine they have a reason. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think I personally, man, I think it's they're lazy about it because a lot of, I mean, it's not going to apply to every sheep unit, but man, a lot of the sheep units that I hunted, you could go in there one year and there'd be like two, let's say two ram tags in there, two big, you know, two big 175 inch rams are going to be in the unit. The two guys that hunt it, they're going to kill those two rams because, you know, there's really only one bachelor group of rams, right? Or whatever, right? Yeah. You're, you're going to, those rams are, are going to be like the hunted sheep in that unit. Those two rams will get killed. And the next year, they give two tags away. You know, whoever drew them looked at the old stats. They assume there's 175 inch rams in there. And they, they would call me and I'd be like, man, dude, you're going to have a hard time killing a 145 inch ram. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's because it's like there. It's not that hard. Like you say, like a lot of these sheep herds, like I could have named every ram. You know what I mean? Um, uh -huh. It's a, I, 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 I find it hard to give them an excuse on that one. To be honest with you, man. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, may, maybe they don't care. Maybe maybe also there's like a part they just don't care as much about the age class. They're just thinking about it in a different way. I I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe they look at the total number of rams and they say we can afford to lose two young ones, but who yeah, knows? Yeah, yeah. But, but it affects yeah. it on sheep. It affects the quality of hunt, man. Because because let's be honest, dude. Like nobody wants to nobody wants to shoot a hundred and thirty inch rocky. Exactly. Yeah. You know? it doesn't even. It looks like a baby. It's yeah, not yeah. even cool. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it kind of yeah. like takes away from they don't they don't look they don't you know they're cool animals but they don't look even real majestic yet you know. Um, yeah. But, but, uh, but yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on the, the, you guys have deserts too, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And deserts are doing pretty good. We, um, basically our best unit had a die off. The Zion unit was famous. We had a lot of really, really big sheep. The state record was from there and several, I, th I think all but like two of the top 10 had been from Zion. And then, starting like 2017 or 18 we started having die off and by 2020 it was garbage like the unit is basically dead and so like this last year i, I know some guys that that went down and helped guide on it and they struggled they spent a combined total between everyone that went and looked they spent like 30 days on the unit and they saw like three rams and only one was good the other, the other two were like four-year-olds um and so it went from the best unit to probably the worst unit in the state but there again that's one that unfortunately a lot of you know your average hunter didn't pick up on that they looked at the previous data and said well geez like the state record came from here like all these big sure. sheep that's the place and then they go and they can't even find a sheep so yeah um that that put a big damper on our tags like they cut i want to say at the peak there was like 11 tags or something on the unit and now it's down to like three and okay. and so that's making a, a backlog of of high point sheep hunters like it's just making point creep even worse yeah because um, it was just, it's a significant chunk of the total total desert desert tags yeah but on the on the positive side we have several units with native utah genetic sheep so they're a smaller subspecies of, of desert sheep um but they've they've got a lot of old rams like the the San Rafael units the um they're probably doing the best as far as age class but they're some of the smallest sheep in Utah so if you just need your tag that's probably where you'd want to apply but but overall desert sheep are doing pretty good we have um a lot of a lot of good things in the works for sheep it's just 
that one unit really gave a big hit to the state. So, because she sheep tends to do that, dude. Unfortunately, yeah, you know, um, terrible. Yeah, but you know, you you'd mentioned the ones died off died off on Antelope Island, and I was going to ask you at that time did did they die of like the same stuff all these sheep die of? Uh, so the island was unique because the state, which I wholeheartedly disagree with this, it really bugs me, but the state wanted to basically purge the island fast as they could so that they could get new sheep onto the island. And, and so they sent a guy in in a helicopter and they shot basically the whole herd, oh, which they geez. knew they were all infected. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how many hunters, they could have done like a, an emergency lottery draw and there would have yeah. been guys that would have went and shot the used the rams everything they could have sold every hunt yeah they could have just been they, they, they yeah they could have just been thousand bucks for a tag come they would have so they yeah people would have no problem exactly especially i mean i can see like say you've got this infected group of sheep and six miles across this drainage you've got this group of uninfected sheep yeah go go blast yeah, them yeah. shoot them out of a helicopter to make sure they don't infect the other sheep. But these sheep were on an island. Like, yeah, yeah. They're not going anywhere. They, yeah. They could have tipped two years and let hunters kill them. And so, yeah, I, I'm not sure the reasoning behind that, other than oh, they were yeah. wanting to, to purge it and get uh, a healthy herd back quickly. Sure. But I think long run, they, they could have got some point, some people out of the point pool, made a lot of guys really happy and a better use of the resource all yeah, the way around. Yeah. So, no, I, I, I totally agree. Now the, the Island sheep, they have no, um, they had no, uh, like, um, you know, outside contact, right. With like domestics or other wild sheep. Like how did they get sick? That's, I haven't heard that yet. I've actually been meaning to, I should have found out before this, no, this conversation, good. but yeah, yeah. I don't know how they actually got infected. That's, inter that's interesting because you all, you know, I mean, there's always the domestic sheep contact and I don't, dude, it's, it's an interesting one, Jace, because I had a group of sheep that, that we hunted that I knew chronically had contact with uh, domestic sheep. They had to have, uh -huh. cause like literally I would, you know, sheep herders would, were pushing sheep in the wilderness right up next to the ridges they were on. And those sheep never died out. And then, and then huh. other other places you hear them they get they contact domestic sheep once and they die. It's it's weird. It's weird, you know. Yeah, it's super weird how fragile and unpredictable they are. Because it, like you're saying, like there's certain herds in Utah that I know contact sheep fairly regularly. Like the the Book Cliff South unit of Rockies, they heard I went shed hunting and I looked and there's these sheep in a flat and one tear up in the cliffs. There's a ram looking off the cliff down at them and. You know, ah, son of a b and yeah then yeah you know, really came of it. Like, yeah and you know that you know that ram you know the like a ram he he would go he at some point went down there and sniffed around you know what i mean um yeah for sure yeah it's interesting dude i i i think that's one of those things that like the science is uh like the they say the science is solved but i really wonder you know i'm not i'm not saying that they're wrong about it but i wonder if there's not like more depth to what's going on you know yeah um, for sure who who knows but uh but yeah no that's uh that's an inter interesting interesting deal man um goats give us the rundown on goats is there any non-resident goats or is it all resident deal um so there, there's goat tags available i don't think that there's any in the max well there is what uh i want to say the you win us maybe i like 26 points okay is the max point but every unit gives random tags to non-residents. So, okay. so any unit you could have a, have a chance at drawing a goat tag. But if you're the max point guy, like in the twenties, you're, there's only one, maybe two units that have enough tags allocated to non-residents that there allows for a, a max point tag. Yeah. I got it's so like desert sheep right now. There's no max point tags. There's not one unit that it doesn't matter if you have 40 points, you're not drawn unless you get, have a little bit of luck on your side. So. Yeah, I got you. It's all about the random deal. Um, yeah. your, your your goat units, man. How how what are the well, how would you describe those hunts? Um, are they uh, are, what's that? Not not bad actually. Like we don't really have like Colorado. Um, that has been my draw strategy in Colorado. I'm putting in for every unit that they say is just brutal. Don't yeah. do it. 
like 12 miles in before you start hunting that's yeah. where i'm applying yeah there's nothing you. like that in utah like, oh, okay like i think probably the most physical unit would be maybe the beaver but e even beaver has a road three quarters of the way up the mountain off the west side and so you can you. get most of your elevation and get hit one of the trails that takes you to a ridge and then you're just running the ridge for three or four miles but um pretty much the win is actually is probably the most remote there's a couple of units you, you would need livestock like a horse to to get okay. in and hunt hunt that deep but it's not necessarily that rugged it's just just the aspect that you're going that deep into the back country to where the goats live so but yeah like the the dutton unit or the even the mount timpanogos there's roads there's um or some of the other units. pretty much they pretty much all have roads at least halfway up the mountain and so you're not looking at climbing 4,000 vertical feet to kill your goat. Like 2,000 vertical is probably oh, on the you. extreme end for Utah goats. So, Okay, gotcha. Really not. Yeah, not too bad yeah. in, in the spectrum of the goat world, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Not not so. bad. Um, hey, I had a question. Somebody actually asked me, and I was told I had zero answer for him. What is the deal on spike elk tags? Is that it? like got like non-residents that are just interested in like meat hunting? Is that is there is there an opportunity for that in Utah? Oh yeah, yeah. So they they do a spike spike elk hunt for every season. So there's an archery spike elk tag. You can buy the muzzleloader spike elk or the rifle spike elk. And so the rifle spike elk hunt runs. Um, it coincides with that mid-season big bull tag. So like early October and it it's I think they give like 10 days for spike hunters um the archery hunt it will be I think it's October or August 21st this year through like September 15th or 17th somewhere in there and you can just yeah over the counter tag you can buy buy the tag and come and shoot a spike during that, oh, that okay. and you and you don't season. have to oh. uh you, you don't have to burn your points no it's just oh, an over-the-counter okay. tag, and they're, they're available basically any unit. I think it's like six hundred dollars for a non-resident, six hundred thirteen this year. They Utah did have a tag uh, fee increase. Basically, um, species every species statewide and for Utah, there's there's a fee increase this year, so non-residents will be want to be aware of that. It did. Um, I think like an elk tag, like a non-resident elk tag, went up like two hundred dollars. So okay, what do you know what it is um, roughly now? I think I think it's 613 now for for like that any bull tag. Oh, okay. And then for a limited entry tag, I think it's like a thousand or, um, uh, yeah, thousand fifty for the limited entry elk tag. Oh, okay. And then 613 for the the any bull or spike bull. Yeah. So. And that's not overly um different. That's kind of in in line with a lot of these a lot of these states, you know, um. So yeah. that's not that not too bad. But if a guy wants to go spike hunting, he's going to be six hundred fifty bucks in for the tag and all the other all the other stuff. Um, yeah, but, non resident combination license is one hundred and fifty dollars now, and so you have to buy a combination license or a hunting license. The combo yeah. makes more sense; it's the best value. So you're one hundred and fifty dollars with a six hundred and thirteen dollar license. So you're you're under eight hundred dollars to come hunt an elk in Utah, and it's over the counter. So. Yeah, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good, uh, opportunity, man. It really, it really is. What's, what's the, what's the, the, the local feel on that? Are, are, are hunters generally positive on it or what? I, I, I've never, I've never been around it. You know, I've never gone on a spike hunt. I've never been around a, a unit that was managed that way. Like what's the thought on it? Yeah. So everyone's pretty good with like the spike hunters on the units. Like, like everyone's cool with you killing your spike. Oh yeah, um, sure. pretty much like when, you're, guys, when you're in the field. Yeah, pretty much everyone yeah. I've talked to, like my my group, we're more inclined. We I'd rather see the spikes live and kill them as big bulls. Sure. And so, like me and pretty much all of my buddies agree, like we wish the spike hunt would be limited at least, like you know, drastically limit the number of tags. Maybe let youth do it, and then like a select few tags for for adults. Um, because as it is, we're killing like you you can buy a spike tag and go hunt any of our limited entry units it's like yeah. say the beaver it's probably the premium unit in utah right now if you want if you have 30 points as a non-resident and you're planning on hunting the beaver in a year or two 
buy a spike tag and come hunt it this coming season, get familiar with the unit, kill spike. And then the next year you can hunt the same unit for your big bull when you draw. Sure. And so we're killing, I mean, we're killing future 400 inch bulls when they're a spike. So yeah, that's wild. I I'm opposed to it, but I understand like the social sentiment, like it's an opportunity hunt and that's what the, sure. the division sells it as is it, it's opportunity. It's hunting heritage. Like, yeah, yeah. I we allow that. this hunt for that, but yeah. And maybe, maybe it's better than killing cows. Cause they, you know, they yeah. Would, yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, I don't even know. I don't know like the dynamic, right. I don't, you know, um, now a spike, is it a clean spike? Like it has to be a clean single point spike or what's the actual definition of a spike? No. So the definition is, um, it has to be a spike on, on one side. So it could be like a spike by six and you can shoot it, but the spike definition is no branch above the ear. Yeah, so basically okay. you got the ear sitting on its head. And as long as if, if there's a point that comes off and drops straight down, even if so if he's a two by two by six, you can still shoot him. As long as that one side, there's no branch above the ear. Okay. Yeah, I got so, you. Yeah, yeah. And um, that basically is just a, a way for them to to give like a, it's basically like a management hunt. Like it allows spike hunters to kill bulls that are either damaged or inferior genetics. So like sure. there's a lot of bulls that will grow like a club and a spike and and they're legal to take with a spike tag as long as they don't. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I wonder what the long-term implications of the spike deal is. Um is it is there is there a management part of that or is it is it is there like a the, the reason i the reason i ask this question is because i know a few guys that actually raise elk jace like they raise them domestically uh -huh. and they don't have spikes like what you just described as a spike their bulls are never that small um they'll they'll actually be i mean i i know some guys that you know quote spikes like first year bulls are 200 inch uh -huh. bulls you know cuz they got crazy genetics and so i yeah. wonder i wonder like utah and I, I don't know how much this is all speculation man i don't know how much impact spike hunters have but are you do you see do you guys see any bulls popping up that you know are forked up on the top their first year that sort of thing i'm just wondering if i'm you know would there be a genetic shift over time due to like a lot of spike pressure i wouldn't think so so i have seen some like they'll have like a little crown i yeah you know i've seen quite a few like that actually but the majority of our bulls as a yearling they just grow a spike yeah that's just spike. what they are yep yeah yeah and so i don't i don't think there's any genetic reason to do it i think that's just what they are and then um basically i what i've had explained to me by like our big game coordinators and, and whatever is it's an opportunity on it it gives yeah, people sure. a part of the hunting heritage and they could do away with it and make up for that to keep population in check kill a few more cows and and they could give a lot more bull tags but they aren't willing to because they they like the idea of of like a mid uh, entry level hunt that everyone can do that still allows you to go shoot a bull out but it's, it's just a spike so yeah yeah no i i i get the i get that logic man i mean and i just don't know enough about like population dynamics i i would be personally if they were like hey we could kill we can you know if we end up with the same we're gonna end up with the same result in the elk herd but if we kill spikes instead of cows we can kill more spikes i i would be pro spike hunt i just don't know like yeah. the dynamic you know what i mean and i've never been yeah. around them so uh that's cool man um awesome well hey dude i appreciate your time uh let everybody know where they can follow you and uh you know keep up to date with things and if you got any anything else uh leave it leave us with it so go for it man um so just quick uh quick break, breakdown on on a few things I, I put down some notes just so i can make sure and mention sure. it so utah did institute this year a mandatory harvest reporting so as part of trying to figure out where we're losing our elk and our deer and whatever um it's it's always been mandatory to report your harvest on limited entry bull elk and once in a lifetime hunts this coming year it will be mandatory to report all so if you get a general oh, nice. deer tag or spike spike elk tag or anything there will be a mandatory harvest survey and if you forget to do it you won't be able to hunt in utah until you pay a 50 dollar fine and and do a, like a late survey so you're gonna want to make sure and do that keep that in mind coming into this year um I think that's pretty much it that that we didn't cover that I wanted to mention. Just keep that in mind, your harvest survey. But 
No, um, and then, dude, that's a great dude. That's a good change, man. I don't know your view on it, but absolutely. like in today's age with the technology we have, there should be there should be mandatory harvesting harvest reporting everywhere. Oh yeah, for sure. Like it's it's so easy with with us. Everyone has a cell phone in your pocket. Sure. It's not like it's hard to log on the internet and and do a, a harvest report. So yeah, yeah, really positive change there. It'll help us with all of our future management to know where we're actually at. Yeah, um, just a complete data data set for the folks that need it. So cool. Yeah, but yeah, they find me JDG Sheds at um on Instagram and or Apex Outfitters on Instagram. Um, got a YouTube that's Jace Guyman hunting. I definitely, definitely no professional at, at videography, but have trying been, to just get you, a little bit you, of stuff out do, there. So. Do you put, do you put stuff on there? Yeah. I've mostly just some personal hunts. Like I did oh, an cool. archery bison hunt. Um, my dad killed a big Rocky last year and Sweet. a few hunts like that. And so yeah, Jace Guyman hunting on YouTube, JDG sheds on Instagram. Um, they can message me any questions, whatever it's, I'm Jay Skyman and more than happy to help just info okay. on draws or whatever. So. Awesome, man. Hey, I appreciate the time, dude. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Cliff.